Today, I've got TC Moore with me. TC, you're a pastor, you're an artist, a writer, and theology nerd, and you just recently wrote an incredible book called Forge, Following Jesus into a New Kind of Family, and uh, really excited to talk more about the book. Uh, but before we get into all of that, who is TC Moore to TC Moore? Ooh, man, how long do you got? Um... We got all day, man. <laughs> I think first and foremost, I consider myself a follower of Jesus. I mean, that's my essential identity. Um, mm. That's how I've patterned my life. That's what I've devoted my life to. I'm also, I, I really love expressing myself artistically. So I do identify as a graffiti artist. Uh, I sort of recaptured or reclaimed that identity um, during the height of the pandemic when we were all sort of looking for ways to kill time. I was like, you know what? I'm going to get back into graffiti. So nice. Um, I'm a graffiti artist. I'm a theology nerd. I mean, I just love, I read theology for fun. <laughs> just like it to, you know, in my downtime. <laughs> so yeah. And um, I love being a father. I love being a husband. Um, love my family. Um, yeah. And I, I guess I would also say, I'm someone who loves to cultivate community. I think that mm. uh, I think that in the midst of community, we we become who we truly are. So I think I've become who I truly am in the midst of community. Mm. Speaking of the the graffiti artist piece, uh, I I have always sort of wanted more of a graffiti type logo for this podcast. Ooh. And uh, do you ever do like digital kind of graffiti artwork at all, or yeah. is it only just like out in the physical world on like? trains and everything no i love digital design actually um uh, my blog is called theological graffiti and it has oh, nice. kind of a graffiti okay. logo to it yeah okay well i'll have to hit you up about that uh because yeah I, I mean i sort of have a graffiti looking thing now but uh it's it's not i mean it's 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 fine looking i think but uh i've got some like kind of more stencil type of graffiti ideas that i would love i to love have. stencil graffiti stencil graffiti is dope Hell yeah! All right, so uh, I'll I'll hit you up about that. Maybe maybe stay tuned. New branding, new branding coming. There we go. Love it. <laughs> uh, all right, let's uh, let's start talking about the book. I, before we kind of dive into the contents of the book, and I really want to dive into specifically like nuclear family stuff because uh, mm. you know there's a lot of conversation about that that I think is worthwhile, uh, especially for those of us that maybe have had a kind of evangelical upbringing. Mm -hmm. um, but, but before we get into that, was there any kind of research going on to this book that uh, maybe you didn't know before? Obviously, this is a book that's a little bit more kind of memoirish, and you're making kind of these constructive claims. But certainly, I would imagine there's some level of research that you're you're doing when you start writing a book like this. So was there anything as you were researching for the book that came up where you're like, wow, didn't know that before? Yeah, actually, there was an article that was really... Um like, uh, con you know, confirmed a lot of my suspicions. I wouldn't say that it taught me anything that I didn't already know, but I, th I didn't see anybody else saying the things that I was saying. It was an article in The Atlantic by an unlikely author. It was um, David Brooks, who... Oh. Yeah, David Brooks. <laughs> David Brooks actually wrote a really good article for The Atlantic called The Nuclear Family Was a Mistake. Oh. And despite his reputation, this article, I think, hit the nail on the head. Um, he's the one that really pointed out that the nuclear family didn't last very long. Like the kind of actual ideal was only from about 1950 to 1965. And then and then we sort of gave up on it. <laughs> um, and he also pointed out that it was really unjust, that it only benefited like white men in particular and and that it never really was the norm, actually. Like, it was kind of a leave it to beaver Hollywood construct that people wanted to be real, but it really never really was the norm. Mm. So it was a really good article. And, and reading that, it confirmed a lot of the things that I was already sensing in the culture. Like, why do we, why do we judge families for not being mom, dad, 2.5 kids, picket fence, golden retriever, right? Like, why do we judge those families? as deficient in some way. Why is that? Like there's some kind of expectation in the back of our minds that's unconscious even a little bit. It's like something's wrong with this family. But actually I didn't think that there was anything wrong with families that had 
uncles and aunts and grandma, grandpa, right? Like nothing wrong with those families. Those families are overflowing with family, right? Right. They're abundant family. <laughs> well, what did you learn about yourself as you wrote this book? Uh, you know, I would imagine the book writing process is a pretty self-revealing type of process. Was there anything that you learned about yourself as you wrote the book that you didn't know before? Yeah, I... I really kind of set the bar high for myself and I initially went into this book almost like a academic and the mm. first couple of drafts of chapter one, chapter two were highly footnoted, just kind of like every paragraph was like several footnotes. And when I, when I, when I showed that to a few friends of mine, they were like, um, who's your audience for this book? And I was like, oh, you know, everyday people, lay people. And they were like, no. They're like, no. <laughs> TC, your audience for this is obviously the Academy. And I was like, no, I don't want the Academy to read this. And they, hmm. they're like, then you need to rewrite these chapters. They are <laughs> way too academic. And I didn't even realize that I was writing in kind of an academic style. So what had to shift for me was I had to realize that like I write differently than I preach. Mm. I preach very conversationally. And when I'm when I'm writing a sermon, I'm not like footnoting it. I'm not like, right. you know, doing a lot, bunch of research. Like, sure, I'm reading stuff and I'm bringing th stuff that, in that I've read. But it's very it's written in a very conversational style because I'm actually going to be preaching it. So I had to shift my focus to like, this is more like a sermon than a paper. <laughs> right. Than a paper that I would write in seminary, you know. Yeah, I remember when I was in seminary, you know, writing those types of more academic papers and then going from that to all of a sudden now I'm being asked to write a sermon and it just does feel very differently. And yeah. you you sort of flex one muscle long enough and you realize like the other one's getting really deficient uh, and vice versa, um, mm -hmm. whether it's the preaching type of voice or it's the academic type of voice. And so uh, to be able to flex both at the same time enough. Uh, so, you know, it's not like you're just doing arm cur one arm curl on one arm, uh, but you're actually doing arm curls with both arms mm -hmm. that uh, that seemed to be a, a a helpful way for me to realize, okay, I got I gotta flex both of these things at the same time pretty frequently if I want to be proficient at both. Right. I also here's another thing I learned about myself. Like initially, I wanted this book to really um, span the whole biblical gamut. So I had chapters mm. that were based in the Hebrew Bible, and I had chapters that were based in the Psalms, and and I had chapters that were based in Revelation, and I, I kind of wanted to have this like full scope of the of the Bible kind of feel to the book. And mm. it just was unwieldy. It, it just I couldn't hold it all together. And so there was, there came a point where I took a writing retreat. I took some time off from work and I went on a writing retreat and in prayer and in like just meditating on on this project, I really sensed that like this is a Jesus centered project. This is about mm. following Jesus into a new kind of family. And so I restructured the book each chapter is based around either a story, a parable, or a teaching of Jesus. That's how I start each chapter, and that's what the, the chapter is structured around. And that really coalesced the book. It brought it together. It, it strengthened it. I think it made it a better book. So that, mm. that was another thing I learned. Like, really, honestly, I'm just at heart kind of like Jesus-centered. Love it. Love it. Well, good thing you're a Christian. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, let's actually start diving into kind of the big piece of the book. And obviously you, you start off the book talking about the nuclear family and, uh, you know, again, I don't know if you grew up in the evangelical world or not, but certainly you've had some kind of, um, proximity to it. Certainly mm -hmm. myself and I would imagine a lot of my listeners grew up in that world. And so the nuclear family was just a given concept. Like you just sort of yeah. thought that's how it's always been. You know, that you have a mom and a dad and the 2.5 kids and um, maybe it wasn't a golden retriever uh, back in like 5,000 years ago, but uh, <laughs> something along those lines. Right. Mm -hmm. And th it's really kind of unbelievable when you start actually learning the history of the nuclear family that you realize how recent of an invention yeah. that is. Uh, before we kind of talk about the history of the nuclear family, just so that we're kind of all on the same page, what exactly is the nuclear family when you talk about it in the book? Yeah, I think it's what you just said. I mean, it's it's this concept that the family unit primarily revolves around two parents and their direct children. 
not aunts, uncles, not grandparents, uh, not cousins. Those are all part of something called the extended family, right? And mm. so it, it creates a divide that is artificial, that hasn't really been a part of human societies for eons. Uh, all of a sudden, it emerged in kind of the hyper-capitalist, uh, modern, Western culture, where enough wealth was centralized in the family that you could live independently of your quote unquote extended family, right? You didn't need mm. that support system. You didn't need aunts and uncles, cousins, grandparents. And also there's the wealth to, you know, put grandma and grandpa in a nursing home, right? You don't, mm. they don't live with you. They live, they live someplace else and someone else takes care of them, right? There's, there's mm -hmm. that kind of wealth. And it creates a really, a really dangerous um, independence, I think. And what I mean by dangerous is um, what happens when the nuclear family falls apart, right? Who do you turn to uh, when the nuclear family doesn't live up to the ideal? Mm -hmm. And that was my story. So I start the book by saying I never experienced the idyllic nuclear family. It was just me and my mom, only, only child, single mother. And when she was diagnosed with schizophrenia, it was like, where do I turn? I don't have mm -hmm. aunts, uncles to, to lean on. I don't have cousins to lean on. Grandma, grandpa. My grandfather was part of my life, but he was sort of like in and out. And and he didn't know how to really manage my mom's mental illness. And so he was kind of like, mm, I'm not sure what to do about that. So. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, so that nuclear family is sort of, again, like that idyllic 2.5 kids, mom and dad, white picket fence. You mentioned mm -hmm. Golden Retriever. Uh, which yeah. I don't know if I've heard that uh, stereotype <laughs> added to it, but that's a great one. I really like that. Um, can you talk about the history of the nuclear family? Again, I think it's unbelievable how recent of an invention this is. I mean, to be honest, in a lot of ways, there are people still alive today that lived before really we really start seeing this uh, invention of the nuclear family, or at least the proliferation of the nuclear family. Uh, and, and that's how recent it is, right? You know, sometimes yeah. we often think about like the civil rights movement being like, mm -hmm. oh, that was so long ago. And it's like, there are literally like uh, colored photos of the civil rights movement. There are people right. still alive today that were <laughs> yeah. not only just like alive as like a four-year-old, but they were alive, like participating in the civil rights movement like that's how recent yeah. it is and, and so often I, I think about the nuclear family in that same way that the nuclear family is that recent of an invention so can you talk about the history like how did the nuclear family concept get invented and what's kind of been its history for the last number of years yeah i think it's really a product of post-world war ii wealth that's now being centralized in white americans so if you remember like coming back from world war, world war ii there was a lot of housing that was mm -hmm. being built in the suburbs. And it was like a planned, you know, um, suburbs. Like they really like, they wanted these suburbs to be for these families that were starting afresh after the war and they had GI money and they had like all kinds of resources. And there was actually a lot of injustice in that too, because a lot of returning black veterans didn't have those kind of benefits. And right. a lot of black Americans didn't have access to those planned uh, developments, you know, some of them were very, quite literally whites only, you know, they were right. mar marketed that way. Um, and so here, here's one way to look at it. If you think about um, the Godfather, right? Think about the family in the Godfather. It's a, it's a very big family. You've got mm -hmm. uncles and grandparents and, uh, you know, you've got uh, children and grandchildren. Like it's a very big family, right? That's an immigrant family. That's an Italian immigrant family that is still kind of under the model of the quote unquote old world, right? The Italian old world model. Then you contrast that with Leave it to Beaver. Like Leave it to Beaver is we are in the suburbs. We are a family unit that is mom, dad, kids. And I don't know if they had a dog. I don't remember if they had a dog or not, but they, they certainly had a white picket fence, I'm sure, right? Certainly. So, <laughs> so that, that's kind of the contrast. Like, so you're moving from this old world model, which has been around for thousands of years, right? Like. For eons, people lived in villages with their entire, you know, quote unquote, extended families, which is just their families right. um, and, and, and in clans and in tribes. And, you know, the, uh, what, I, what I mentioned in the book is that actually for millennia, for eons, family wasn't just biological. It was also those people that you did life with in your village. That was also right. part of your family. You didn't think of them as like strangers 
or even just like, you know, the folks who live down the street, they were part of your village. They're part of your, your tribe. And so this, this nuclear family identity that emerges in like the fifties, that really does destroy a sense of community that has been mm. a part of human society for a very long time. Mm -hmm. How does this concept of nuclear family, especially as it like proliferates post-World War II in the 50s especially, mm -hmm. how does it kind of get, uh, how does it get kind of borrowed or not necessarily even borrowed, like how does it get like attached is maybe the word I'm looking co for. Co-opted. <laughs> co or yeah, co-opted, yeah. even better word to christianity especially oh. like white evangelicalism because yeah. again you're, you're saying i mean there, even christians for thousands of years did right. not uh d did not do family like this and then all of a yeah. sudden you have this like white suburban american kind of family right. that is a certain kind of family structure mm -hmm. that emerges in the 50s and then all of a sudden American Christianity co-ops this as if that's how family has always been done. Uh, so can you talk about that history of how did that happen? How, how did the nuclear family become Christian is maybe the history yeah. I'm looking for. There's a word for it, and the word is syncretism. Mm. So oftentimes when you hear the word syncretism, it's often in the context of um, when missionaries have done work overseas outside the United States and they encounter cultures that have mixed Christianity with something else. Like take, for example, voodoo or Santeria, mm -hmm. right? People use syncretism to describe those cultures, right? Like that's an amalgamation of some other kind of religion with Christianity. But actually what happened in the 50s and 60s was a syncretism with Western culture. Western mm -hmm. cultural values of ind individualism in particular individualism, consumerism, capitalism, and racism, all of those kind of Western values uh, were syncretized with Christianity. And they were packaged as one kind of one deal. If you, if you want Christianity, it comes along with these values of individualism, right. uh, ca ca market capitalism, and, uh, and racism. So what, one of my, my first professor in seminary was Dr. Sung Chan Ra. And um, he famously wrote a book called The Next Evangelicalism, where he talks about the Western white cultural captivity of the church. This is kind of a play on the Babylonian captivity of the papacy. You remember mm -hmm. when the, the papacy was in, was in France for a, for a, mm -hmm. little, a little while? And they called that the Babylonian captivity of the papacy. So he's saying in his book that actually Christianity's had this Western cultural captivity, where it's been captured by Western culture and held captive um, to the values of Western culture. And he points out these values, you know, individualism, racism, uh, consumerism. So in the 1950s and 60s, there was this amalgamation, this syncretism of Christianity with these cultural values. Say, take, for example, um, focus on the family. This has mm. been a staple of white uh, conservative Christianity, evangelicalism for mm -hmm. decades, probably still exists, right? Focus on the family still exists. Uh, yeah. Oh yeah, it certainly exists. James Dobson isn't really involved anymore with them, but he, but certainly, focus on the family does exist. Yeah. So if you grew up in, you know, in evangelicalism, focus on the family was, was just part of your life. It was just part of like part of the wallpaper of the room, right? It's right. there. Yeah. And it's and it's. I, and it's I, an, I actually have a funny, uh, quick story. Um, so yeah. James Dobson was like the director or whatever of Focus on the Family for many many years, and obviously Doctor, it was like really Doctor politically. Dobson. What's that? Dr. Do yeah, Dobson. Dr. Dobson. Well, in fact, <laughs> so th this is part of the funny part of the story. So in fourth grade, there was a classmate of mine who uh, I, I don't like I don't he didn't really go to church or anything, but uh, he, he was having some issues um, in his home life. And I, I remember like, you know, I'm like fourth grade, like talking through, like he hearing his story and finding out like he doesn't have exactly the best home life or whatever. And I remember one time during recess when I could have been playing, you know, playing basketball with my friends or whatever during recess, uh, I sit down with him and I was like, and his, his name was, well, let's just call him John for now. And I said, John, I'm Dr. Dobson and I'm going to help you. And so I was like trying to like pretend, you know, like when other kids are like pretending to be like Michael Jordan or whatever, I'm trying to pretend <laughs> to be uh, Dr. James Dobson. So anyway, that's my funny focus on this family story. I mean, that illustrates how influential 
focus oh on God, the family yeah. was. It, it was something that you aspired to be like. You wanted to be like Dr. Dobson, right? And and so al- along the same lines, uh, family values becomes a catch-all for these Western values that are now packaged with Christianity. Fam- family values becomes a way of saying, do things the way white Western people do them, and then you will be a good Christian, right? So once you start to decouple those things, once you start to realize, wait a second, there's, you know, there's been Christianity long before Western culture. There's Christianity outside of Western culture. Mm -hmm. Why are these things packaged together in America as one unit and sold that way? Right. And Mm -hmm. so once you start to decouple those things, you realize that like Jesus had no allegiance to these family values. (laughs) Jesus had no allegiance to this concept of the nuclear family. In fact, you could say he was hostile. You could say that. You could say he was hostile to the idea of of keeping your love within a small bounded set of people. He was actually preaching quite the opposite of that. Expand right. your family. You know, bring others into your family. Show the love of God in such a way that you are that you are uh, extending the table to more and more people, inviting more and more people in. And so, I mean, a famous example of this is when Jesus's own mother and brothers come to him and they, they have heard of the things that he's saying and they think he's lost his mind. So actually, I think Mark's account says they go to take charge of him. So they're on their way to take charge mm. of him. And somebody says to Jesus, hey, your, your mother and your brothers are outside. They're looking for you. And he says, who are my mother and my brothers? Who, who are they? And I mean, everyone's like, well, duh, they're, the, they're outside. They're, they're, they, and he says, no, actually... My mother and my brothers are those who do the will of the Lord. Mm-hmm. And he, he, he teaches this expansive, countercultural way of understanding family that is inclusive and expansive and redemptive. I would say even redemptive, like bringing people into the family of God as a way of liberating them from uh, oppression. And actually, this is very closely tied to empire as well. So I, mm. I show in the book that um, historians and, and researchers like David De Silva have have unpacked how closely the family unit in the Roman Empire was tied to the structural stability of the empire. Good families mm. make good empires, right? And so you gotta strengthen the family, and you gotta you know tighten up those those uh, authority authoritative hierarchies of the patra familiaris or whatever the Latin is for that, right? You've right. got to tighten that up to sure up the empire. So what Jesus is doing is actually really radical and it is undermining and subverting the foundations of this empire. Mm. One of the things that I remember hearing very frequently growing up, and, and this ties totally together around like, we need strong families for a strong empire is often hearing about like fatherlessness like that yes that sort of this yes. like the sort of research or whatever around that in particular and you know, hearing that on fox news all the time and mm-hmm. obviously that was like super coded for like black people really suck at right. family or whatever right. and they therefore suck at supporting this empire yeah, uh, yeah. but yeah, often hearing all about like just all this conversation about fatherlessness and that we need we need families with fathers and uh, again and that's not to say like people shouldn't have fathers in their lives. Certainly, like that would be something I think is great and wonderful. But it is to say that even for those that don't have their fathers in their lives, that there's lots of ways that we can be in relationship with one another, that people grow up healthy uh, and um, don't necessarily have all that trauma. Um, but it doesn't necessarily mean that there has to be like a guy with a penis that uh, was your biological <laughs> father or whatever, and he has to yeah. be in your life or whatever. Like. Yeah, sure. Like that's great if if that person is, but also there's so many other ways that we can do relationship where we can raise children in really healthy ways, uh, even outside of having that person be in their life. That's exactly my story. I I did grow up without my biological father, and being inducted into this new kind of family that Jesus teaches has given me multiple fathers. Has given me so mm. many fathers in the faith. Who I from whom I've received so much more than I could have ever received from one biological father. I, I have spiritual father figures uh, that I've had for decades in my life who come from so many different backgrounds and so many different perspectives, and their wisdom is born of so many different experiences. 
that I could never have replaced that with just one guy who looks like me, right? right? <laughs> one guy who has my same DNA. That would be a deficiency, actually. And I right. think Jesus is saying, we don't want to limit our experience of family just to the people who share our biological DNA. Like, what about family who can show us parts of our lives that we can't see? Mm. Show us aspects of ourselves and our and our way of being in the world that need to be more expansive. For example, my first sort of father figure in the faith, who I talk a lot about in the book, uh, is a Filipino-American man. And I remember conversations with him about being the only Asian-American in his high school growing up and how he experienced discrimination. And that was, an, that was a conversation that was really enlightening for me uh, because I, I, I didn't have that experience, right? Like in my high school, I was probably part of the majority group, you know? I can't remember the demographic exactly in my high school, but yeah, I mean, it was, it was pretty normal, right? So having that uh, input, having that insight from a father figure was, was valuable, crucial, in fact. Mm. So things like that, like, um, yeah, I'll just leave it there. Like, yeah, that's, that's part of the reason why I wrote this book is because we need more than just one biological dad. <laughs> right. So we've talked about the nuclear family, its history, mm -hmm. and all of that. I'd love to hear, and this is one of the things I love about your book, is you definitely do talk about some of these different types of families throughout the Bible. And so can you talk about maybe some of the more notable ones that you feel are, are worth lifting up a little bit? But yeah, can you talk about some of the different kinds of families, uh, maybe even before Jesus, uh, that you think are worth bringing up? Uh, and certainly I want to talk even more about the family that Jesus creates. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, if you... If you if you import a nuclear family model, that that um, that construct from the 50s and 60s, if you try to read that back into the Hebrew Bible, you're going to have a very difficult time. <laughs> <laughs> Families in the Hebrew Bible do not conform to that norm. So take, for example, just Abraham's family. What do you do with Hagar? Hagar mm. is someone, apparently, whom uh, Sarai can offer Abraham as a sexual companion um, to procreate with. And she's a servant, a slave in the household. Um, where does that fall in the nuclear family construct? That mm. obviously defies the mom, dad, 2.5 kids ideal, right? Right. Um, what do you do with... Uh, uh, Families like David's family. <laughs> David's family is kind of a hot mess, right? Because he's free to apparently have harems and um, uh, he's free to have concubines. Um, I mean, the, polygamy is a part of the cultural landscape of the Hebrew Bible. And it's, it's not challenged in a direct way. So mm. certainly there are passages where you see God say like, I think that, you know, your harem or your or your concubines could be leading you astray. <laughs> but it's not like that just having a, a, a harem or, or concubines in and of itself is a violation of God's law. So the idea that, you know, there's a nuclear family in the in ancient Israel, I think, is ludicrous mm -hmm. biblically. Mm hmm. But I wouldn't what hold them the up as of... the ideal either. <laughs> right. I wouldn't hold those those families up as the ideal. Right. Right. Exactly. What are what's the kind of family Jesus creates? So I think when you see Jesus going around and gathering disciples, I think I think we often think of that kind of through the lens of church. We think of that as like, oh, that's you know, he's the pastor, they're the congregants. But really, mm -hmm. at a certain point, you know, he's letting them in to his life at a very intimate level. He's he's walking with them and they're walking with him and he's sharing his life with them in such a way as he's actually building a family. I would say mm -hmm. the first family Jesus builds are his disciples. And he says, no longer do I call you, you know, my servants for you have become my friends, right? Mm -hmm. Like I'm letting you in at a deeper level. And then from there, he expands that family to the 72. The 72 are not just, uh, they're not part of the crowds. They're not yet, they're, 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 they're a one tier, one concentric circle closer to Jesus than mm. the crowds who just kind of swarm around Jesus. And so the 72 become part of Jesus's family. And I think that, 
you see this in Paul's life too. I think in in the New Testament, Paul is is continually referring to his um, co laborers uh, as sisters and brothers. Um, mm-hmm. In fact, I argue in the book that one of the revelations that Paul has, one of the central defining revelations that Paul has, is that the body of Christ is the disciples of Jesus. Remember when Jesus Mm -hmm. appears to him and says, it's me you're persecuting. Well, he hadn't yet made this connection between the disciples of Jesus whom he's persecuting to the person of Jesus. So that's the first revelation. And then what happens from there? Jesus, uh, Paul is sent to a disciple of Jesus. And um, I forget his name. What is his name? It's, you know, the dude, who, the dude who says, Brother Saul. That Brother Saul mm. revelation, um, I'm, I'm forgetting the dude's name. Is it, um, why do I want to say Erasmus? <laughs> it's not Erasmus. That's not, what is yeah. that dude's uh, name? Uh, uh, Ananias. Ananias, right. So he's sent to Ananias, and, and the first thing Ananias says to him is Brother Saul. So connect these two revelations of Paul that he has of, of the body of Christ. Jesus is mystically connected to his disciples, and his disciples are a family. Mm. That's what I'm taking away from that. And then, then you go on to read in, in, in Thessalonians, which is arguably one of the earliest Christian writings uh, ever. In Thessalonians, Paul is talking to this church uh, in Thessal- Thessalonica, and he's saying, I not only shared the gospel with you, but I shared my own life with you. As a mother shares, as a nursing mother shares her life with her, with her children, right? So there's this intimate fa- familial bond that Paul is, is familiar with through Jesus and is spreading to city after city after city. Hmm. I think the family that Jesus is creating is multi-ethnic. I think it is culturally hybrid. I think that it, it honors the individuals and their and their unique identities, but it also incorporates those unique identities into a new identity. Mm. And that new identity is culturally hybrid. So I I, I borrow that that concept from uh, scholars like Willie James Jennings, Brian Bantam. Mm. They've talked a lot about cultural hybridity. And I think this was really this was really important for me to understand about family. Families develop their own culture, a family culture. Jesus mm-hmm. developed a family culture, um, like like the meal that Jesus gave his disciples is part of Jesus's family culture. We come together around a table, and we share this one meal, and this brings us together. It, it defines us as a family, and I think that Jesus's family is also one that witnesses to the broader society a new way of being human. So it, it shows a way of countering those unjust advantages that society gives to some people and not others. In Jesus's family, we right those wrongs. We lift mm-hmm. up those who are downtrodden. We, we elevate those who are, who are cast aside or who are um, dismissed, right? In our family, everyone sits around the table. So this is actually what, what caused conflict in Corinth, as you mm-hmm. know. What mm-hmm. caused conflict in Corinth was there were rich and poor, Gentile and Jew, and they were having difficulty uh, working out those th- that equality around the table. How do we mm-hmm. do this Jesus thing, this Jesus culture, when we, in the broader society, we would never have mixed. We would never have sat at the same table. Uh, you know, you're supposed to be in a different room. <laughs> you're supposed to eat a different meal. And now we're, we're called by Jesus into the same table to eat the same meal across culture, across even race, if you want to call it that. It wasn't called mm-hmm. that back then. But And across class. How do we do this? And so that's where that's where Paul is really upset that they're doing this badly, right? Mm-hmm. Some are getting drunk. They're eating before everyone else, right? And so that's that's the, the family culture that Jesus is creating. It's, it's a culture of equality, of equity. It's a culture of cultural hybridity. Um, it's a culture of of, uh, of love, serving one another. What did Jesus do at that meal? He, he, he knelt down and he washed his disciples' feet, modeling for them that in this family, we serve one another. Mm-hmm. One of the ironies uh, that I see a lot of the kind of Christians that 
really support the nuclear family, you know, a lot of them coming out of like white evangelicalism is a, a lot of these people, uh, I, I get obviously like they, they think you should get married, you should have biological mm -hmm. children, so on and so forth. The funny thing is the, the two probably most important people in their faith, Jesus and Paul, never got married <laughs> and never had biological children. And right. so it's really funny that the people, the, the, the two people that probably are the most important people in their faith and, and they built their lives around are the very people that would, th that didn't follow what they think should um, be followed when it comes to the nuclear right. family. Let's get really theological here for a second, okay? I know you're going to love this. Let's Great. get really theological. If you truly believe that the kingdom of God is eternal— and you truly believe that your destiny, your afterlife, your eternity is secured in that kingdom, that eternal kingdom, not by having offspring, not by having a legacy and having, having uh, in people who are going to inherit your wealth and carry on your family name. If you truly believe that your, your destiny and your your eternity lies in that eternal kingdom, and it has nothing to do with, with having children, but has everything to do with your allegiance to the one true God. Then that cultural impetus, that cultural pressure to get married and have kids, is it evaporates. Mm -hmm. Jesus, Jesus was actually literally teaching people, your eternal life, has nothing to do with getting married and having kids. Your eternal life has to do with being connected to me. If mm. you're connected to me, you are assured of eternal life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Not having kids, not carrying on your legacy, not passing down your wealth, having a good family name. None of that is your destiny, your eternity, your afterlife, your whatever you want to call it, right? That's mm. not what secures the kingdom of God for you. What secures the kingdom of God for you is being connected, being joined with me. Paul understood that. Mm -hmm. He literally taught the church in Corinth this. He said, I wish that you would all be like me, unmarried, just focused on the kingdom, just building the kingdom, right? right. But if you need to get married, because you know, you can't, you, yeah, can't, you can't control those lusts, you can't control those urges. Well, uh, sure, I guess I'll allow it. But that was not the focus. The focus right. was our eternal life is secured in our allegiance to Jesus Christ and nothing mm. else. Mm. I mean, that you really want to like get theological about it. Yeah. <laughs> if you really want to get theological about it, Christianity subverts the family. Right. The nuclear it, family, yeah. The nuclear family, yeah, exactly. The nuclear family. But not the family that Jesus is building. Because mm -hmm. Jesus is saying, we are family. We don't need to have, like, we don't need to procreate to be family. And we don't need to get married. To, to be family for one another. Mm -hmm. We can be siblings in in faith and be focused s squarely on the kingdom of God. Mm -hmm. This is where Sister Dr. Asasi Diaz comes in because she argues in her work, her theological work, that a better modern application of Jesus' kingdom of God would be kingdom of God. Mm -hmm. So she hyphenates mm -hmm kingdom takes out the G and just calls it the kingdom of God. That's mm -hmm. more, I think, probably a better modern adaptation because oftentimes in modern Western thinking, kingdom has connotations of power structures and even right. patriarchy, right? And she's saying that's not what Jesus was talking about. Jesus was talking about this extended family, God's household that we are invited into. And it's not about power over people. It's not about coercion. It's not about violence. It's not, it's definitely not about patriarchy. So it's more like a kingdom than a kingdom. Mm. One of the other things that was really interesting when I first started learning the early history of Christianity, and I think I learned this when I was in college, went to a little small Christian college, and I learned about some of the, the 
the reactions of the Roman Empire to these early Christians. And yeah. there were a lot of there was a lot of confusion by non-Christians in the Roman Empire at the time uh, about Christians. And one of those confusions was, you know, they claim that they're eating this guy. Are they cannibals? <laughs> right. Like cannibals, that was one of yeah. the confusing things. But another confusing thing was that they all called each other siblings. They, right. you know, they called each other brothers and sisters. Like they're not all related. Like how could they all call each other <laughs> brothers and sisters? And, and so that's a, another really interesting point is the fact that especially these early Christians really truly lived in this new way of being a family that was confusing to the imperial kind of family at the yes. time in the Roman Empire. And subversive too. Yeah. Really undermining that, that <laughs> hierarchical system of power, right? So what do we do with um, this movement that is incorporating slaves and women and calling them family, calling them sisters and brothers? Like this, this has the potential to undermine our way of doing things, which is very hierarchical, right? Slaves have to stay in their place. Women have to stay in their place. Well, if there's a movement which is elevating slaves and elevating women, this could overthrow our entire, our entire system. And in fact, it did, right? <laughs> like, you know, over the course of 300 years, now you have the emperor wanting to be a Christian, thinking that it's politically advantageous for him to claim to be a Christian. Started out as being absolutely treacherous to be a Christian. And now the emperor wants to claim to be a Christian in mm. 312, right? So that, that's the amount of cultural shift that's taken place in 300 years. One of the things that I often hear from my queer friends, especially queer friends that have maybe been like kicked out of their family mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. they're queer, uh, you know, again, knowing a lot of the listeners of my podcast, maybe some of them have that experience. But oftentimes they talk about this idea of a chosen family. Yes. And, and a lot of them, you know, when it comes around like Thanksgiving or Christmas or other holidays, they don't go home to their biological family to celebrate. They they are with these people who are their chosen family, you know, a lot of really close friends and, and others. And the way you're describing this kind of family is not, not to say that the biological, you know, your biological parents or biological siblings or whoever uh, are, should not be important. They certainly can and should be if you want them to be. But to sort of extend that, that there are lots of other ways to think about the family is, is so important. Um, but, but I'm curious, like maybe, maybe, maybe it was research or consideration as you're writing the book around kind of this like queer understanding of chosen family and how queerness really, uh, you know, the, honestly, to, to, to Put it simply, I think the way you're describing this kind of family is a, it's a queer way of thinking about family. I think that's fair to say. Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> it wasn't research. It was um, it was my experience as a pastor in L.A. Uh, when I was in L.A., the church that I was serving at the time really marketed itself as an inclusive church that was on all the like that was on the website. that was on all mm. the flyers, the marketing. We're an inclusive church, inclusive church. And it was a, an incredibly ethnically diverse church. It also attracted a, a large number of members of the LGBTQ community. So probably when I was there, I was there like three years, it was probably 15 to 20 percent LGBTQ, which was high for that area and high for a evangelical church. So um, I had a lot of conversations with members of that church who said to me, I I came to this church because it was inclusive and I, and I, I love this church and I've grown in this church. However, I don't feel like I'm fully allowed in. There's, there's an invisible barrier where I can't penetrate. And the more I, I heard these testimonies, the more I, the more I heard these uh, accounts of chosen family being kicked out of their own family and finding family at this church, right? I realized that we had really created a glass ceiling. We had we had created boundaries around what it meant to be family for the LGBTQ community. And that mm. began to really like like convict me. I felt really guilty about that. And it, it started to cause me to reevaluate my theology around LGBT inclusion. And so in the book I do I I have a chapter about this where really the witness of queer siblings in Christ 
challenged me to go back to the scriptures and reevaluate what I thought was obvious, which wasn't all that obvious at all. And I came to the conclusion that really it was the way of Jesus challenged me and actually called me into full inclusion of uh, queer siblings in Christ, which was a huge transition. I mean, I was out of harmony with my denomination and in, in danger of being defrocked with my denomination. Right. And, and um, thankfully, you know, there are traditions in the body of Christ at large, which do not hold those views, right? Do not mm-hmm. exclude uh, our queer siblings. And I want to say too, that like this concept of chosen family also was ingrained in me from a, from a young child uh, through gang life. Like my, mm. my experience of gang life was also chosen family. Um, I say in the book, like, which is true, gang life for me was the closest thing I had experienced to family up until that point. Mm. And unfortunately, it had all the toxic traits of some families, some dysfunctional families. It had all those toxic traits, but it was a chosen family. It was a family that I opted into and provided that stability for a time uh, that I needed in, in some very destructive ways as well. But mm-hmm. yeah, that was my experience. And I actually got, <laughs> I actually learned a lot about Chosen Family from X-Men too. If you remember the X-Men uh, cartoon from Saturday mornings, you know, um, that was a, that was a, a theme where, you know, a, if you were a teenager or a tween in those years, like in the nineties, you identified with the X-Men because you're like, yeah, like there's a special, there's a school for specially gifted, you know, superhuman mutants right <laughs> and if you feel a little bit like a misfit like an outsider you're like yeah maybe there's a maybe there's a there's a place for me too maybe there's a school for the, for me too where i can belong where i can be accepted even with all my weirdness right mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. you talked about this a little bit ago especially talking about uh paul and the church in corinth and kind of the mm-hmm. differences that were a part of that family and navigating that conflict but You know, again, uh, knowing that a lot of the folks listening to this podcast probably grew up in some evangelical world and therefore have some kind of maybe difficult relationship with their family from, you know, growing up at, you know, with in the churches that they were in and even maybe their um, biological family, nuclear family. You know, certainly that that is my relationship. Like I have a good relationship with my parents and my siblings, but I also like don't have maybe exactly the kind of relationship that um, other people have with their parents and siblings, b- partly because of our theological and political differences. Mm-hmm. And so I'm wondering w- with the kind of forged chosen family that you're obviously wanting to propose, how would you suggest like navigating those differences? Um, m- maybe it's with a biological family, but maybe it's with, uh, the chosen family that, you know, Mm -hmm. knowing that because we've got, we're humans, we're going to likely have differences and conflicts. How do you navigate the the differences and and conflicts within a forged or chosen family? Yeah, this was actually something that came up really, really early in the book. Uh, I felt like you can't become forged family because forged that metaphor entails pressure and heat and you know the shaping and molding of metal right iron sharpening iron so mm-hmm. you can't really become forged family without working through conflict and i think that jesus actually gives us a framework for working through conflict and it entails so this is the caveat in order to follow jesus program of working through conflict you have to be a committed member of jesus's family if you're not a committed member of jesus's family then you're, you don't sense that same sense of obligation to follow mm-hmm. Jesus's program. Mm-hmm. Uh, Jesus says, you know, if, if a sibling sins against you, go to that sibling, confront them, tell them about the sin, right? And that assumes you guys have already established the sibling relationship. We're talking about mm-hmm. people who are in the family. So if your biological parents, biological siblings, if they consider themselves part of Jesus's family, if they identify as Christians, they are saying, I'm on board with Jesus's program of conflict resolution. And you can use that as a framework. You can say, okay, here's what Jesus said to do, right? Let's follow his program. Mm. If that doesn't work, if the direct approach doesn't work, Jesus says, add to that, that direct uh, approach 
a couple of witnesses. And this can sound like, initially, it sounded like this to me, it can sound like ganging up on somebody. Like, oh, I'm going to go get backup, and I'm going to bring my backup. But actually, it's not that at all. I think what's implied here is that other perspectives being incorporated into this conflict is going to not only address the person that you're confronting, but also address you. Mm. So you're able to see another side of the conflict. Maybe there's there's some gap in your understanding that needs to be filled in. TC, did you consider this part of the conflict? And you're like, oh, and then you have a totally different perspective on what you're confronting the other person about now. Mm-hmm. Um, so so the, the second layer is two or, like two or three witnesses. Then Jesus says, if that doesn't work, bring them before the whole church. Now here's where you have to get into a little bit of uh, biblical criticism, right? Because mm. we know that the gospels were written after Paul's letters. Right. And so Paul's already been creating churches. He's been, he's been planting churches, forming, forging family in Christ for, you know, a couple decades <laughs> before we get Mark uh, or Luke. And so when Jesus says, take them before the whole church, what I interpret that to mean is the proto-church that Jesus was forming in his ministry. Mm -hmm. So when Jesus is going around gathering disciples, like I said, the 12 and the 72, there's not the same infrastructure that later develops. There's no elder board. There's no no constitution and bylaws. There's no denominations, right? We're just talking about this family of disciples that Jesus is forming around himself, right? So I call this the proto-church. And I really like this concept of the proto-church. Actually, I like it more than I like the institutional church. A lot of Forged, the book, is a little bit anti-establishment, anti-institutional. Mm-hmm. I, I think we should all get back to sort of the proto-church. But, but he says, bring them before the proto-church. And I think this is also another layer of accountability that says, actually, you're part of this bigger, broader family. And if mm-hmm. there's going to be conflict between two members of this family— and it's not going to be resolved between the two of them, and it's not going to be resolved with two or three witnesses, then we're going to have to bring it before the larger proto, proto-church. proto um, And then finally, the last step is if, 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 if it still can't be resolved even before the, the proto-church, then Jesus says, treat them like a tax collector or a, a Gentile. Now, our sister pastor, Melissa Flora Bixler, in her book, How to Have an Enemy, really helps elucidate, like, this is not a punishment. This is not Jesus going back on his word and and now now he's excluding people. Now he's now he's making enemies where he should be uh inviting people into family, right? No, 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 no. Jesus loved tax collectors and gentiles. Jesus was constantly reaching mm-hmm. out to them, constantly incorporating them, trying to incorporate them into his family. So this isn't a punishment. It's saying these people have chosen or are at this current state are not part of the Jesus family. So they haven't, they're not committed members. There is a, there is a commitment that Jesus asks for to be part of his family. Uh, You got to be in. This this is something I say early on in the book. Uh, One thing that I took away from gang life is that it's not wishy-washy. You're either in or you're out. There's no like, well, I'll think about it. (laughs) Maybe, maybe I'll be a part-time gang member. No, you're either in or you're out. There's a loyalty. There's a, there's a allegiance that's expected. And Jesus is like that too. Jesus wants allegiance. He wants loyalty uh, for faithfulness sake. So I would say that with our biological families, our extended families, and I'm in the same boat as you, um, if they identify as members of Jesus' family, we can invite them into Jesus' program of conflict resolution. And maybe they can become forged family, not just biological family. Hmm. Uh, last couple of questions, TC. Uh, the tagline of my podcast is exploring, inspiring, and liberating theologies. So how do you hope this book inspires and liberates its readers? Oh, yeah. This is this is great. So at the end of the book, I, I the last chapter is about um, the murder of George Floyd and how that affected my forged family, how that affected my personal view of family. And one of the things that I learned from that experience of being here in the Twin Cities at the epicenter of a global reckoning with racism and police brutality is that I realized that to be forged family, you really have to be a prophetic witness to the powers that be. Mm -hmm. 
Mm. That's part of what it means to be Jesus' family. Jesus' family was constantly subverting and calling to account the powers that be. Jesus' family was a threat to the empire, and eventually, you know, it's going to overthrow the empire, right? And Mm -hmm. we know how the story ends. The kingdoms of this world become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, right? Like, so we know that the witness of Jesus' family is one that says, you all will be held to account. You who uh, oppress the poor, you who brutalize black Americans, you will be held to account. I think that it's true what what Dr. King said, that Jesus' family, the church, is not the servant of the state, not the master of the state, but the conscience of the state. We're called to be a prophetic witness. And I think that's a liberating witness. It's a witness of when you are part of this family, you are no longer captive to the powers that be. You are freed from the powers that be. If you have been marginalized in the broader society, you are centered in Jesus's family. If you have been downtrodden in the broader broader society, you are lifted up in Jesus's family. Um, this is what Paul calls giving special honor. We give special honor to those parts of the body who are dishonored in the mm-hmm. in the larger society. Mm-hmm. We bring them into the center. We lift them up. Um, in our little community of misfits that we call Roots, um, one of the ways that this shows up is we think about accessibility. We think about accessibility a lot. What are people who are differently abled, how are they able to access this message? How are they able to access this community? How are they able to access this gathering? We're constantly interrogating our own assumptions and our own norms because we're if we're able-bodied, we just we just navigate the world unconsciously just right. thinking like, well, everybody can do what I can do, yeah, but that's just not the case. swimming in water. Exactly. And so we have to ask ourselves, is this building accessible? Is this message accessible? Is this is this gathering accessible? What about the ways that we do preaching or the ways we do music? Here's a small example. This is a tiny little example. Um, on a Sunday morning, we were passing the mic, giving updates, milestones, and celebrations. Members of the community were getting up and sharing birthdays and promotions and things like that. And somebody said from their from their seat, they said, "Oh, I'll just yell loud. I'll just I'll just talk loud." And somebody said, "No, use the mic. Accessibility." <laughs> and it's because some members of our church have a difficult time hearing. There's some mem- members that are a little bit hard of hearing. And so using the mic is a small act of love that says, "I'm I'm going to make sure you hear what I say. I'm not going to mm. assume that you can hear me if I just yell from the back of the room." Mm. That's just a small example, but like we have to continually interrogate our assumptions to make sure that we are a liberating, prophetically witnessing community. I love that. Uh, Last question, TC. How can listeners get connected to you and your work, and where should they get the book? Yeah, so I I created a website specifically for the book, forgedfamily.com. So you can go there and pre-order from all the usual suspects, you know, Barnes & Noble, Amazon. If you're anti-big corporations, there's Bookshop. <laughs> you could mm-hmm. you can order it directly from Broadleaf Books as well. Um, and then for me, I have my own kind of author website, uh, tcmore.net. Love it. Love it. Well, TC, so, thank you so much for chatting more about the book. I, I think it's just so, so important. Uh, it, the way, the, sort of rethinking through family and how I understand family has been a really important process of my uh, spiritual journey for the last number of years. And so th- this re- this book really sort of uh, encapsulates a lot of those thoughts. And so thank you so much for talking more about it. Thanks for having me. This was great. <laughs>